what's good farmers my name is antonio and uh before i give the word to mr gorenson here uh i want to give you a fair warning this is not a sponsored video okay i'm not getting any money for it besides what i'm getting from the youtube ad revenue of course oh so i'm not a shareholder of encore energy and i will not become one at least one week after the recording of this video which is july 21st 2021 oh so if you hear me sharing my opinion then that's just what that is okay it's just my opinion and as a reference you know if you're wondering whether it's a good decision to listen to me i'm not a financial nor an investment professional i'm not a broker nor an expert nor do i have a phd i'm a 25 year old college dropout who lives with his parents and has a very high risk appetite but has no credentials nor experience nor, nor anything among those lines that is relevant to this industry so I would say it's likely a bad idea to follow my trades or put any importance or weight to my opinion whatsoever. On top of that, I want you to know that the companies that I speak to are oftentimes highly speculative investments. Okay, the, 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 those, the, the, the share price of those companies can go through massive booms and busts, sometimes losing over 90% of their value and then trading at pennies for decades before recovering if they even manage to recover or you know they, they could just go plain bankrupt it happens a lot as well basically sinking shareholders money with them you losing all of your money so please understand this okay this is not just some random disclaimer these are things that th these are ser serious things and there's just too many people out there and i know i'm ranting but there's too many people out there who will make you believe that they're the best stock pickers because they have the fanciest phd degrees out there and have been picking stocks for like 25 years and you know, their farts smell like magic and they make money while, while they dream of Megan Fox in a final suit. While in reality, they either have no idea what they're talking about, they're being paid to promote some garbage company, or they just want to lock you to their investment platform that has all the answers to your financial problems, of course, right? And the even worse reality is that you could end up losing a lot of money, even all of your money, if you decide to put weight on those people's opinion. So I suggest you consider doing your own analysis and building your own conviction. And if you don't know how to do that, I would suggest you spend the time learning how to do it or, um, you know, I guess contact a licensed professional to help you out because nobody that you see in this video is a licensed professional. You know, before you YOLO your money into something, some someone else's dream house or dream car, I would suggest you, you think about those things. Anyway, with all that said, Mr. Gorenson, I don't want to lose any more of your time. I'm sorry you had to sit through this. So uh, thank you for investing your time in me today. Well, thank you for inviting me. I look forward to our conversation. Yeah, me as well. First time that we're ever speaking. And uh, yeah, I'm happy that we finally got in touch. And um, oh, by the way, I didn't ask you. I hope it's okay to call you by your... Uh, well, that's not your first name, but I hope it's okay to call you Paul. Is that okay? Yes, it's my middle name. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, Paul, it is then. Uh, yeah, well, Paul, thank you. Thank you for that as well. Um, you know, when I, when I research natural resource companies, uh, given that I, I'm, I've just started doing that, it's, it's easier for me if I have some sort of a, I guess, like a step-by-step -step research framework, if you want to call it. So now I've sure. called mine the six Ps. They were the five Ps. I've upgraded them. So uh, those six things are the, the, the primary metrics, the uh, place, project, the people, the perils, and the sixth one now is the plans for the future. So I'm hoping we can uh, go through all six today. What do you think? Sure. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll do our best. We'll see what we can do. And, and hopefully yeah. I'll be able to uh, uh, provide the information you need. Oh, yeah, I think you will. It's not like you lack experience. So uh, I think, I think okay. we'll be fine. Put around the block a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll talk about that right away, actually, starting with, uh, with the primary metrics here. Um, yeah, tell me, Paul, uh, if we, say, met in an elevator and you had to give me as much inf information on uh, Encore Energy in, I don't know, let's say, let's say a minute, what do you say to me? Well, I'd say, first of all, that uh, Encore is a, we're, we're tra transitioning to becoming an ISR uranium producer in situ recovery. And we want to be, we're actually doing that growth uh, to um, become the dominant, we want to become the premier or dominant U.S.-based in situ recovery uh, operator. And by doing that, uh, by being premier, we want to be the, the most, the best, have the best uh, cost profile, but also to have the best strategy uh, and growth profile uh, to support our shareholders' value and grow that value. 
that's a quick description. I like it. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there is currently about 225 million fully diluted shares. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yeah. What well, part of that is your warrants and your options overhang? Oh, uh, gosh, that's, uh, I don't have that right in front of me, but it's relatively small. I think it's probably, let me see, it's, um, it's going to be less, obviously less than 10%. Okay, that's good. No, that's good. You know, if it's less than 10%, this definitely helps me out. And uh, I guess we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but before that, do you, do you have an idea of when, when those become free trading? I know that these are like technical questions off the bat, but the, you, it's going to make sense in a second. Well, some are already, some of the warrants are already free trading. I mean, they're, they're already, but uh, they haven't been exercised yet. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, there are some that were issued uh, in, uh, back in the, the bulk of the, the warrants that are outstanding right now were issued back in uh, uh, October of 2020, and then the balance are, were done in our most recent financing, which was in March. Mm -hmm. And okay. so uh, as I don't have the specific dates in front of me as to when they come, you know, uh, but I know that some are already, you know, already free trading, uh, had already, uh, and, and some folks have already exercised those. And I believe the ones that were issued in March are, have either become free trading or they're very close to that. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, I, um, you know, right now trading at, a, at, a, at about a dollar per share, let's say Canadian, that would mean that um, you know, you're trading at about $200 million market cap, again, Canadian that is, uh, with no debt, which I like, but uh, about 20 million in the bank. Is that, is that correct? It's less now. And so, obviously, since we did our financing back in March, we've uh, done a couple of things. We've acquired, we purchased 300,000 pounds of uranium as a strategic inventory for our, uh, to, to mitigate a potential production timeline, a production delivery timeline uh, issues that may come up. Not that we're anticipating any, but they're there to mitigate that risk. And also, we've uh, been completing uh, reclamation work at our, Two South Texas sites where that uh, we were using, you know, when we acquired the Westwater assets, we did acquire a higher cash burn than our traditional cash burn was prior to that, which was around a million dollars a year. Uh, we're closer to four and a half million dollars a year now, cash mm -hmm. burn. Okay. And so on top of that, we've uh, ex started executing on our, our limited capital program. And so uh, we we have about five million in cash and about another nine point uh, four million, or depending on the number, uh, the spot price you're running from one day to the next. Overnight, just over nine million dollars worth of uh, liquid assets in the form of uranium. Okay, that's good. So that's about fifteen C and C. Uh, well, that places yeah. you about what one eighty five uh, enterprise value. Yeah, that's right. Around those range. Yeah, why I'm why I'm getting at this is because this is an interesting price range for me. Uh, um, as oftentimes that's a you know it means a more liquid stock relative to some of those you know twenty or fifty million dollar companies, and um, being a relatively liquid stock, this could attract some uh, institutional capital. So um, I'm wondering whether that's already happened for you, and um, maybe this is also where you can tell me more about who owns your company, Paul. Well. The I don't have a breakdown on who, who owns it. We know some of our largest shareholders uh, uh, that uh, the institutional side, we do know that, that the, uh, we've had a significant amount of uh, buying and we consider that part of the, it's hard to classify, but the ETFs have been doing quite a bit of activity in our, our space since uh, earlier this year. And uh, so we've, uh, and the, the challenge we have is we don't know exactly what they own. You know, because it's not they don't haven't reached that reporting level of five percent. Uh, so we have some shareholders that have three or four million shares, uh, and uh, and then we have these ETFs, which they have public listings on what they own of us, but uh, we haven't. Uh, you know, they're not doing any. They're not required to do any reporting. Yeah. So I don't have. You know, we we have a couple of them that uh, are out there, uh, and I'm not sure if I've got permission to use their names. That's why I haven't set them yet. Well, okay, let's say, uh, I also had a different question prepared for that price range. Staying in the topic of price range of about like 190, 180 to let's say 200. I'm wondering, how do you compare yourself to other companies that trade around the same valuation? Let's say, for example, one of the companies I like is uh, UR Energy, for example, which is in the US. Uh, or maybe some of your um, Australian or Canadian peers, let's say, 
what's the company around that? Yeah, probably Boss Energy and see ISO Energy out of Canada. Yeah. Well, every every company you just named has a different are, are different than by just by structure. So your energy, which is one I'm most familiar with, and that's simply because I know the management team very well. Uh, there has, uh, you know, they've been a, a traditional uranium producer, uh, and uh, so their their models built around strictly on their their Wyoming production assets, the Lost Creek and everything else. So that they're focused on that. Uh, you know, they they uh, and then when you get to Boss, uh, Boss has. Uh, uh, they've acquired the Heathgate, not the Heathgate, but the, uh, the former uh, Honeymoon Project, the Honeymoon Project from uh, Uranium One, et cetera, and they are intending to execute that uh, development of that project. So they're a developer. They've got production facilities not too dissimilar to what we have with our Rosita. I, I would say if you had to do kind of a, I wouldn't say we directly compare, but kind of a proxy uh, that uh, we would be more on the, the the, the the view of what you would see like with uh, boss whereas your energy has got a very mature operation very well you know uh well developed uh, site we are we have established production facilities that we're re rebuilding much like boss and we're adding resources to fill in the you know acquiring resource properties to fill that uh, production demand that we'll have once the uh once we get uh, get into production and so that's why I see the similarities. ISO, is, as you know, is, an, is more of an exploration company. They are uh, focused on the, in the Athabasca, but they're a long term, you know, they're, the Athabasca is just a different world than, say, the U.S. is, or even Australia, for that matter, from a, a future production yeah. type of uh, scenario. When you say that, you know, I mean, you explained it perfectly. You are energy already an established company. They can get to production by the flip of a switch, more or less. Um, so I'm thinking, how, how do you, why do you think you're trading at, at sort of the same valuation as where they are trading, given that you're not going to be as quick to jump into prediction as they will be, you know, so possibly we'll talk about that, but possibly not as cheaply. So, yeah, what do you think? I think that, well, first of all, I wouldn't say that not as cheaply. I think we'll be, but I, I, I know what the properties we're developing and acquiring, and I believe we can be competitive on a cost basis with, uh, our peers up in Wyoming. Uh, I've worked in Wyoming. I know what the costs are. I know what they they show as well, and I believe we'll be competitive to that. Uh, the only thing I don't have right now is a full blown PEA on the Texas properties right now that I can go compare apples to apples, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, my experience uh, working in this industry drives me to that conclusion, and uh, and I think that we're trading uh, at levels close to theirs because with the strength of our management team it drives that. So we've got the, the, the production facilities, we've got the licenses, we have a strategy for growth, both in Texas plus our New Mexico, you know, our future long-term growth is in New Mexico. So we have a multiple series of projects and a long project, a rather what I would say a long project pipeline uh, that, uh, that your energy doesn't present itself, present right now. Not to be, I'm not trying to criticize or be critical. I'm just saying that that's when you compare those two, and uh, and uh, so we get valuation for our whole portfolio. They get valuation for their portfolio and and uh, their operations experience. We have the operations experience, but we we're going to demonstrate what we can do. We have to execute, uh, and uh, but we still are. You know, whether one's ready to turn the switch or not today. Uh, I think is a material in today's uranium market, but possibly based on everything we're, you know, I've been learning from the utilities and other things is that as we get closer to 2023, we're going to see a, a, a different uranium market, which will be much more favorable to production. And I think that by that time, we'll be starting up about, you know, assuming the market conditions arrive, we'll be starting up about the same time your energy does. Anyways, I think, it, you know, uh, they have an advantage because they've got everything in place today to turn on. But until we see a, the market turn and improve, neither, none of us are turning on until that point anyway. So I've got, I'm building my strategy to be, be ready to go when, when we expect the market to show up. That's a good point. Is it, am I getting it correctly that you expect to see um, a uranium price that helps you go into production by 2023? So say $60? Uh, well, actually, I'm thinking lower, <laughs> you know, 
in the, the high 40s, 50s, you know, is what I'm expecting. I'm not as, uh, as aggressive in the $60 range. Uh, you know, we did just complete a PEA for Juan de Foya, but that's a conventional mine that used a reference price of uh, $60 a pound. Uh, but uh, I, I believe that we can be, our ISR properties will be much more competitive at lower, even at lower uranium prices. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'm definitely going to talk about that PEA when we get to your, uh, to that P for of the project. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you for that so far. This, this does help me bring it uh, into a picture how you relate to those companies. And um, for example, one thing that I like comparing companies based on is their leverage to uranium prices. And you just mentioned something about that ISR. So, um, well, yeah, let's talk about it. I'm wondering with the, with the growing uranium price, how leveraged are you to it? And um, can we maybe already put some numbers in, in place? When you say leverage, I mean, with respect to, uh, to st I want to make sure I'm answering the question correctly. So I want to get the context of leverage. When you say leverage to it, I mean, that the right now, uh, you know, we, we, don't have, we don't have any legacy contracts that tie us to a specific price yet. Uh, but uh, so any movement in spot price would, uh, assume, assuming it occurs while we're in production doing sales, we'll be able to, to price against the, uh, the spot price at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the, I believe, you know, I believe that the price level that we would be looking at is somewhere, we, you know, obviously uh, if I had a pen a number, it'd be something around $50 a pound would be what I would you know, even a little lower than that would be something I would say would give me the incentive to, to start production. Okay. When I classify start production, that is, I would go commit the limited capital necessary to go put in well fields for an ISR operation. I'm not going to go spend and put in a whole bunch of patterns and everything else until I know I can sell that uranium at a price that will support that. And so, but I can get everything else up to that point to where I can be ready, you know, be at that point where I have to do a I have well understood capital burn and I can spend that and get it into production immediately. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and that number, you know, if I had numbers north of $45 a pound, it would probably give me, that would be something I would look at as a incentive price uh, starting point. That's an interesting one because you just also mentioned your, your PEA. You said it, it's based on a traditional mining method. Um, indeed, in it, we saw $56 break even. Yep. Um, and you know, that's not a great thing to be talking about when we're now at what, 32 and a half, yep. you just said, you know, we can go lower and, uh, are we talking about your break even price or does the 45 include CapEx and a return to shareholders? That's all in sustain. That, that's, that's actually per, for the profit. And I'm focusing on ISR, not a one to FOIA, two different animals. Okay. Mm -hmm. Montefoya, the, the, the PEA was done as a conventional underground mine. It would require the construction of a mill, et cetera, to go with it. That's why you see a higher break-even price. Whereas with the in-situ recovery facilities we have, obviously there's a lower cost for entry with respect to in-situ recovery because you're not having to, the, the CapEx, we have, we, we just, by, by buying the production facilities through our Westwater transaction, We've avoided thirty to forty million dollars in capex alone just for the, the processing plant, and then on top of that, with the uh, the, the acquisition with the Westwater acquisition, we have also acquired satellite ion exchange plants. With that, uh, which we've avoided, that allows us to avoid the uh, the cost of uh, satellite plants. That's another twenty to thirty million dollars. So that's why we see ISR in South Texas as a way to go. We can go and 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 putting in well field. Uh, is, uh, you know, for the first uh, well field, we're talking uh, to get into production, we're talking probably $5 million to put, uh, you know, 700,000 to uh, 800,000 pounds of uranium in situ into production. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that would get us, that would kick us off and allow us to start adding a continuous well field. So our all in sustaining cost, we don't have a number pinned, but if I had to base it on my experience and what I what I know about the depths and and the the recovery rates and everything else and the information I have currently at hand, uh, we would see all in sustained cost at uh, in the, the the higher end of the thirties for yeah, South okay. Texas. Okay, so that's um, you're looking into a wide margin there. Um, there was a, a capex of about seventy nine million dollars in that PEA. 
So what, what are we talking yes. about? The 40s then, if you play ISR? It, it, it would be, well, see, if we were to do ISR, yeah, it would be in the 40s. Uh, no, the, uh, the, the break even would be somewhere in the, the, uh, the uh, I would say the, the mid to high 30s, depending on the project. Every project is unique and uh, has different costs associated with it, whether it's depth, grade, or, or, uh, or just space, just the, the area itself that goes with it. even royalties factor and vary depending on the properties. Wantafoya Marquette, uh, the Wantafoya project uh, was done as with the assumption that uh, in addition to sinking the shaft and advancing, you know, uh, developing the drift underground and also including the, uh, the construction of a small mill that would be fit for the size of mining that would be coming out of, uh, out of that, that one particular mine, that's that 79 million that we're talking about. Well, are you then saying, you know, look, that PEA, that was, it, was, it was a documentation thing, all, all nice and well, but then uh, the seventy million dollars that you had calculated for the MPV, and there was a a, a pre tax five percent discount on MPV. Um, that you know the seventy one million dollars actually MPV was at around seventy dollar uranium. That's that's not really what you're going for, is it? No, this Wantafoya is a pipeline project, mm -hmm. so it, it's it's going to go. It's it's a it is a project that we plan to do later in the five plus year window. And that's, that's we, we would not be turning it on. We would not begin to develop it and advance it until we see market conditions that uh, exceed that $60 per pound price. Mm -hmm. But right now, the holding cost is relatively low. As it stands right now, the, the, the holding cost is relatively low. So uh, uh, to hold that 21 million pounds or whatever, or 18 million pounds of uh, uh, in, indicated resources, it's uh, something less, it's around $100,000 a year to hold that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. it's relatively low holding cost, and so what we that leverages to do. That's what when I talk about our mix, when we compare us to our peers. That's what gives us why. That's why you see our valuation where we're at, is because not only do we have, you know, uh, this this pot of this these limited ISR pro this ISR projects in Texas, as where we're, our short term vision is. We also have our New Mexico story, which is our long term vision. And Montefoya is part of that longer term vision. That's going to be the what I see as the as the momentum projects that kick us into a larger, you know, a, a different space when it comes to the size of the company and the amount of revenue we have. We'll start when we see prices get at sixty plus. You'll see us talking about executing on developing uh, Montefoya Marquez. Uh, whereas on at lower prices, we'll be focusing on Texas and our ISR our future ISR properties in New Mexico. That does make sense. And what I'm thinking when you're seeing that is that it looks really good. And that also gets me wondering, you know, if you think that you, 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 you know, you bought that project from uh, Westwater Resources at a good price, wouldn't that mean that they might have made a bad deal? So, you know, that, that also gets me thinking, why would a company like Westwater Resources want to make a bad deal just to get out of those uranium assets right at the beginning of a uranium bull market? Like, why did this sell them to you for that low of a price? Well, you got to understand is that Westwater is focused on, on battery metals. Uh, they've changed their strategy and their company. And, and uh, their story is built around battery metals, electric vehicles, and all the, 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 the minerals. So they're, they're, they've got graphite, they've got lithium projects. They have decided to exit strategically the uranium industry and uh and and uh and keep in mind is that uh, also when we announced our our uh, uh letter of intent uh that uh back in september the market the uranium market was different than it is today the equities are completely different now the beauty of it is that yes it looks like it's a relatively low price they pay but submit that was paid for in stock and if they held that stock through from the time we completed the transition transaction to the point, uh, let's say as recently as a month ago, they would have had a substantial uh, improvement in their value of that, that transaction. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it's a relatively small number, but they, they were leveraging, you know, they get to see the benefit of the higher equity prices because of the, the value of the stock uh, improvement. And uh, 
And so they may, I, I don't know what they've done. I don't know when, they, if they've sold their, their, their holdings in Encore or if they sold a portion or all of it or still hold it. I don't know because that's, that's their business. But uh, uh, they, they made a fundamental decision a few years ago that they were going to exit the uranium industry. And we found, we provided them the best pathway to do that. When you, when you talk about paying with, um, with shares, that's also something that interests me. Um, there's a lot of criticism out there for doing that. You know, some people would say the company is treating their shares as, as just paper and, and, and they would prefer to buy, you know, assets and stuff, you know, just do deals with their shares instead of using money. So uh, how did that work out? How was that decision taken and why did you decide to pay with shares? Well, you know, when, when you're dealing with a, you know, a public company like we, we are, I mean, you know, we have to get, we have to raise financing one way or the other. So either we can do it one of two ways. We can either finance the project through a basically a 100% share transaction, like we did with Westwater, or we could go do, the fi do a financing, whether through debt or through, uh, which would most likely be done through converts, convertible debt, or through uh, you know, either a private placement or a public placement, uh, where we would have to, there would be some uh, uh, hit to our, you know, our, a dilution, but also a hit, very likely a hit to our share price. We felt that a lot of companies what, on both sides, unless there, there's certain companies that will only deal in cash, uh, but uh, there are companies like Westwater that are also publicly traded companies. They see the opportunity as, uh, uh, you know, there's value in, in getting company shares where they can ride the, the the, if the market's improving, they can ride that up. But also, it keeps us from having to go out and do punitive deals to raise cash to do these acquisitions. So it's actually, in my opinion, if it can be structured right, which I think the Westwater transaction was done, if it can be structured right, doing an all-stock all deal is actually more beneficial for our shareholders because it limits the amount of dilution at the front when we do that. In other words, you know what the what the amount of shares you're issuing for that value based on a V, you know, whether at close uh, based on a, a VWAP, et cetera. But uh, you know, it, it it's less punitive than what it would have done if we tried to finance this before we had the latest equity rise. Mm -hmm. uh, we and so you know, you typically when you do a financing, you're always offering something at a slight to your your shares for a discount to market. Uh, quite often, it's been my experience. Uh, uh, and uh, and so it, it becomes more dilutive at the beginning. But uh, and, uh, I just think from a value perspective, it, uh, it becomes less of a cash drain. Uh, and also, it, uh, I, I think it creates, makes it more, the, the transaction more creative in the long run. Fair enough. It is what it is. And uh, if, you know, keep, to, to keep on talking about the next B, which is the projects that we're doing right now, uh, I'd like to know more about your other projects where well, we focused on the Westwater one uh, or the one that you bought from Westwater Resources. So, uh, yeah, Paul, what, what are those um, like break-even, CapEx, and MPV numbers of uh, some of your other projects? Well, we, we right now, the first, first only PEA we have done right now, there's other ones that have been done with some of the projects we're executing on that uh, need to be revisited, then we haven't published those yet. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, the first one we did was Juan Tafoya Marquez because we already had the existing, all everything we needed to do to update the technical report and to do this was already in hand at the time we completed the Westwater transactions. It's just a matter of putting them together. Yeah. And uh, the, um, but as far as the others go, we haven't actually, we haven't released anything publicly on the other projects we're developing right now. And when I said actually acquiring, because we, we will put something out once we complete the acquisition, but uh, to be very frank, uh, where we're doing this property acquisition, and, and we've been very successful at this point, and we've got the core properties acquired, uh, it's very competitive. There's other uranium operators in the area. Think of the Athabasca, you know, but this isn't the Athabasca, but as a model you think about. It's very competitive as to where you go and place your, uh, do you, you know, whether you're placing claims or doing property acquisitions. You don't want to get to a point where multiple buyers are trying to run up the price. So we've been very quiet about what we're doing specifically. Uh, but these projects have been developed. They've, they've all been, uh, the ones we're focusing on prioritizing at this moment have all been developed in the past. So we know what the costs are. And we know that uh, they never were put into production, but we know what the costs are to, 
to put them into production. We know what their cost of production are uh, because we have experience in that. And so when I talk about uh, all in sustaining costs of some, and I'm giving ranges because everything depends on the details and those details hasn't, haven't been fully ironed out yet. But those ranges of, you know, between $35 to $39 a pound, maybe even some of them, you know, some of the properties are relatively uh, low cost. Um, and so we can actually do better than that. But I, I'm, I'm hesitant to put out MPVs and everything else because we actually haven't run those and made those public information yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, so it puts, me in a, it puts me in a difficult situation because I don't want to go raise expectations or mm-hmm. make promises uh, until we have a little bit better information to provide to our shareholders. No, I perfectly respect that. I should have added that, you know, we obviously forward-looking statements and I was also yeah, yeah. mostly asking about your expectations about those because indeed you haven't put out um, your own PEA yeah. yet. Um, yeah, you, you did put out one PEA and it, I was a little bit surprised to see that being the first PEA. You just explained why that was. Does that yeah. mean this is, this is your main focus right now? Is this project your main focus right now? The PEA, no. Our main focus is Texas. And you will see, you will see, uh, we, I hope by the end of this, before the end of this year, we'll be releasing technical reports and PE, uh, maybe there's enough quality data that we may be able to go to a pre fee study on it. May, I'm saying May. It may not, you know, the, uh, but uh, certainly we'll be able to establish a PEA with these properties. And uh, that'll show an MPV and, a, you know, and, and an estimate of cost. And I think they'll be pretty accurate and, and reasonable. Uh, but, uh, you know, I've got, we've got some, what we're doing right now, we're reassessing the resources based on a different, you know, I brought in a new geology team, uh, to help us, uh, reassess the resource estimates from the prior, that was the, from the historic resources. Uh, we're also currently applying for permits to do drilling, uh, which we hope to have by at least the first one by the end of the month to go and do confirmation drilling to ver- validate just the numbers that are in the ground that uh, we, we're very confident in, but you always want to check. And so we're intending to do, do that as well. And uh, uh, that's what's going to help build our, our, our the strength, build in the strength into our technical report that will help support a PEA for these projects. Mm-hmm. Okay, this does make sense. Thank you for the update as well. And uh, I'll, I'll likely be following up with those updates. Maybe we can have a Absolutely. call when you release one of those. Um, I would be glad to do that yeah thank you thank you for that you know before before we spend too much time on that though before i lose too much of your time here i'd also like to get to know the people behind the company better you know sure. the people that are expected to to move you forward essentially and um uh, by the way i'd usually spend more time on, on, on the place but as you mentioned it's new mexico it's texas in my eyes they're both pretty straightforward mining jurisdictions um but though talking about the people um I, the way I see it, the people are also a main selling point for Encore, for the Encore story. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm hearing, though, left and right, that skilled workforce, albeit actual boots on the ground workers or, you know, explorationists and, and assistants, advisors and so on, they're sort of like at, at the end of the rope. Like, uh, you know, I talk to CEOs that are concerned that there's just not enough quality workforce for the mining industry out there. So given that, that you're pretty proud of your team and you've got that quality workforce on there, I'm mostly wondering how do you plan on keeping them to, to work for you without increasing the operational expenses too much? Well, so fortunately, the people I've, I've – uh, so the, the, you've got, we've got the management team we talk about all the time, which is a core group, myself. We got Bill Sheriff, who's our, our executive chairman, and we've got Dennis Stover, our chief technical officer, with a tremendous amount of experience, and a few and a couple others that are also on our you know the service board members, but also they are they do provide cons- you know they do provide advice, et cetera, and support. Uh, we we've also acquired a pretty quality workforce that came through the Westwater transaction of about twenty people, and they're they're experienced. Uh, they uh, they they. They've experienced operations with production, with development, construction, and decommissioning, and reclamation. So they've got all aspects under their belt. So I've got, I got a core, I got uh, some quality engineers that came with that acquisition. Uh, that uh, it's a matter of uh, basically giving them the ownership of the projects to carry, which I have high confidence they can do. 
they've demonstrated their, their competence and they can, they've also dem they're demonstrating their capability of executing, which is important to me. Execution is, is a, and, and delivering on results are, is a very important point for me. And I, we have a quality crew, but also the people who turn the wrenches, who pull the wires, who, who uh, pipe, construct the pipe and put it together. I've got a core group and hiring people. Uh, yeah, there, there, are, there are difficulties in hiring people, find people that really want to work and have to get out and work in the field. And in and, and South Texas, uh, if you're familiar with our climate, if you think about Florida, but hotter, uh, it's pretty humid, it's, but it's very hot. And so right now it's uh, where our office is, where I'm at right now, it's, it's uh, I'll speak in Fahrenheit, uh, it's it's uh, 93 degrees Fahrenheit, but at the operation out west where Rosita's located, it's well over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. And so uh, uh, you got to have people who are willing to work in the climate. The beauty of what we have here is that uh, uh, in the South Texas area, we have a lot of oil and gas workers who aren't working right now because uh, even though we talk about higher oil, oil prices and gas prices, uh, there was a during the, the pandemic, there's a tremendous drop off and in, in activity in the oil field. And so we have a large set of skilled workers who are who don't want to move from Texas and go to North Dakota to the work in the Bakken oil field and all that stuff. They'd rather stay close to home. We offer good, we, we can be competitive on wages and benefits without breaking the bank on our part and, and uh, hire those skilled workforces. And uh, so... And we've been, you know, we've been very good at retaining people. Uh, and uh, the team I've been building uh, as well since I came on board, I brought on two geologists and I brought on another engineer as a project manager. Uh, they wanted, they came to work for me because they all worked for me in the past. And uh, they, they've seen, you know, uh, I've had, you know, I like to, I don't brag about it much, but other people like to talk about the fact that, uh, you know, I've had some really good successes on development and construction of facilities and operations. And uh, those people that have come to work with me want to come work and they want to, they want to see these projects succeed. And they've got a, a really high level of engagement and uh, activity. And that, that's, that type of uh, engagement and enthusiasm is, uh, is contagious, if that makes any sense to you. It, uh, it does, makes yeah. it easier to to bring on younger people to because none of us are young. Uh, all of everybody who's the, the, the I'm talking about the folks at the what I see as a core team. Uh, a lot of us have a lot of gray hair, and in my case, a lot less gray hair than others. And it's not because it's darker. And uh, uh, but we're able to. Re we've got some younger folks that came with the Westwater transaction, but also uh, we've been staying engaged with some younger folks who want to come work for us uh, when we're ready to hire them. And, and uh, I haven't gone out and hired a bunch of people right now. And that's simply because it's early. It's too early to go and build up a large team. Uh, we want to be, we want to ma manage our cash, our cash uh, use. And we can do that by, by managing our headcount, focusing on strictly on what we need today because we can always, we can add later. And if there's a risk that we may not have access to people through other competition with other mining companies, well, that's a risk I'm willing to take at the moment, uh, simply because I don't want to go and build up a large work, uh, over, large amount of overhead that burdens these projects right now. I want to build up, not, not have to pull. It's a lot easier to add as you need it than it is to take it away when you don't, when you don't need it. Oh, absolutely. I agree with that. I actually like that approach. And, um, you know, talking about wages and yourself, it gets me thinking, it's one of the viewers' favorite questions. Do you feel comfortable talking about how uh, you get compensated for your uh, work at Encore, Paul? It's all public. Yeah, so it's all publicly disclosed in our annual, our annual reports. So I, I make about $270,000 a year, mm -hmm. and uh, I get some options now and then, and that's, that's my compensation. Yeah, I appreciate you and being a honest. Bonus, yeah, yeah, and there's a bonus structure, but uh, you know the uh, uh, that bonus structure only kicks in when we're doing really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I appreciate you being honest about it. And indeed, it's it's always all public information when you're a CEO of a publicly listed company. 
I'm mostly asking these questions to see the way that CEOs answer them because you'd be surprised mm-hmm. that some of them just don't want to just they just don't want yeah. to talk about it themselves and and it, it's a big thing when you you know you, I I didn't even have to ask you about a specific number you just said it yourself so I do appreciate that and um but I do excuse myself if I went too far with those questions I I, I no, just find them no. important yeah no and, it's um, not I'm I'm ashamed of or or you know reticent to answer I wouldn't you know. I, I, I believe that uh, it's important for the CEO to have a reasonable salary. I, obviously, you know, there's, I believe what I'm getting, you know, it, it's, if you do a comparison like similar companies, you might find it uh, we're on the lower end. Uh, but everybody's, from my perspective to everybody else in the organization, we see a lot of potential upside down the road. So uh, why not save that, uh, those pennies for later when we need them? And, yeah. you know, you just said something that's very interesting to me. And, um, I think you covered this in a, in a in another interview. I believe it was with Smith Weekly Research, um, where where okay. the host basically asked you why you went from Energy Fuse to Encore, and um, basically summed up. You concluded that you came to a point in your career where you wanted to do, you know, to achieve something else, which I assume you couldn't do over at Energy Fuse. So I'm curious if we could get a bit more specific about it what is that something that you, you couldn't achieve with energy fuse but you think you could achieve with encore well it's a difference well the energy fuels is a is just a completely different company than encore is and encore is a uh, if you look at it from the perspective my perspective it's more it's a it's an entrepreneurial uh, uh, type of uh, strategy and company uh, Energy Fuels has, they have some very good projects. They have a, a good strategy and I was part of developing that strategy. Uh, but it reached a point, you know, where the, where the uranium market is and, and uh, uh, where the company wanted to be relative to uh, their, their ultimate strategy and, and their structure. Uh, I, it was, uh, we came to an agreement that it was, uh, I, I, I didn't, you know, I, I saw that I wanted to go do something else, which was more, uh, boots on the ground, you know, basically lifting something up from its bootstraps and building something new. And uh, at that point at Energy Fuels, that wasn't, you know, that, that opportunity wasn't available. I wasn't unhappy there. I loved the people I worked with and uh, the company I feel is a good, strong company. Uh, but I just wanted to do, you know, I, I, you know, I'm getting close, you know, I'm not a spring chicken anymore and I, I want to have one more uh, uh, opportunity to do something uh, like I've done in my past career, which is to build something and, and execute and deliver a whole new project uh, and make some, create a company that's uh, uh, that's uh, able to execute and, and show to shareholders. And, and I uh, effectively, I want to see if I can do pull off some of the magic I did back in the last uh, run up. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's a nice that's a nice goal, and I appreciate you sharing it. Um, I guess this partially answers some criticism that I found out there, but you know what, as a, as a follow-up, let me give you some of that internet criticism, something that I, and I, I didn't kick, come up with this myself, but I did come across it on, on stuff like message boards and stuff like that. And I'm not sure what to think. And I think we should address it. Like some people are speculating that your addition to the Encore team was mainly to create cloud, to do, add credibility say and to strengthen the story and attract the capital from the people who have you know followed you through the years and you know they say that the credibility that you will build for encore actually comes at a steep price which i don't agree with they refer to your paycheck being a steep price but and again i don't mean to insult you in any way that's just what i wrote what i read mm-hmm. on the internet but i'm curious as to what you have to say to those critics paul well uh you know, everybody's entitled to their opinion. And uh, uh, I, I certainly don't take offense to what they say, is that uh, the only thing I can do is deliver results and show that I can execute. Uh, you know, and and hopefully, you know, if I have a chance to meet up with those critics in a bar and have a beer with them and show them that, that uh, uh, maybe they, they need to recalibrate their, their, their expectations of me. I think I, you know, I, I, I I had been part of uh, Encore before. I served on their board when Energy Fuels had had a, a board seat, and I developed a high respect for the team. And most of the team that that that's at Encore, I've worked with before, so I have a high level of comfort. Yes, I do bring you know you know it's, I've been told I do bring a lot of credibility for executing, and and there's people who 
who have followed me and who come along with it. But, uh, you know, it, I wouldn't have done this if it was just me. You know, I, I, uh, I did it because I saw the opportunity and uh, uh, as an opportunity to, uh, uh, and I, I like the, uh, I have a, a high level of confidence with uh, uh, the board of directors uh, and the management team at Encore that, uh, that I had a high level of comfort, high level of confidence but also the high level of knowing that I would get that support and that, uh, uh, you know, that back, you know, basically the support to execute. And, uh, uh, and, you know, I, you know, I just hope that, uh, you know, with the, with the critics out there that uh, I can um, uh, uh, create, a, you know, basically provide them the opportunity to take advantage of, you know, of what I can deliver. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can't say, you know, I, I would say that I did not, I intentionally did not come into Steve Price. <laughs> I, 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 I took, when I, when I took the offer, I could have asked for much more money. I'm sure of it, but I didn't. I, and that was a very specific reason I didn't is I didn't want to burden the company with the overhead. Uh, the one thing that kills these com kills companies is that uh, it creates the inability to execute. And, and then the, what do you call it? The serial dilution effect is they create a high level of uh, overhead uh, through a lot of the things they do and uh, the and I didn't want to be the principal cause of that really why I'm why I guess I guess why they why they're concerned about it is that they just want to know that essentially what it comes down to or, or where it where it starts from is that they want to know that you and your team are not in it for the salary and and to get out in a few months and um, you know, one thing, by the way, that I'm thinking about that could diminish that that risk or, or that thing that people are thinking would be that you and your team own shares of the company. So, uh, do you have an idea of what percentage of Encore is held by uh, insiders, and also maybe who are those insiders? It's about ten percent of insiders. I would say the largest owner is Bill Sheriff, our own our executive chairman. I have about seven hundred and fifty thousand shares myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, some I bought recently, and others I I I, I bought through exercising options uh, when I when I was a board member after I left the board. Uh, but uh, I also don't sell. You know, I'm not selling any. <laughs> yeah. And uh, but uh, somebody I, I couldn't tell you all the other insiders on who what their ownership is. I just don't have that breakdown, mm -hmm. and it's not because I. Uh, I just haven't focused on that. I just I rely on what uh, you know what uh, I hear from our corporate secretary uh, as to the insider ownership and uh, keep track of that mm -hmm. as best I can. But I don't focus on it. No, fair enough. Uh, what you said that you've been buying some that's um that's very interesting to me because and it also surprises me because I've been buying some uh, uranium stocks during the recent the recent dip myself. Uh, Encore Energy, for example, is down like twenty percent in last month. So um, I would expect insiders to be buying during the, this time, and that's not the case for every company. So, uh, yeah, when did you used to buy? Did you buy any during this uh, recent dip? No, I haven't. I, it's just, I, I've ex what I did was I've executed, I had another tranche of options I executed on to, to buy some, you know, to buy some shares, and I tend to purchase some more. And... Uh, but uh, you know, I also got to be cautious of my own personal cash <laughs> you know, to uh, to keep. I I'm, I do carry a pretty diverse portfolio myself, and I have ownership in other uranium companies. Uh, but uh, I uh, also have a pretty diverse, you know. And I you know I just I, I do intend to buy some more, but I just couldn't tell you exactly when. Mm -hmm. I, I was uh, looking at the the price most recently, and of course, by the time I made a phone call, we actually improved but that's not doing any doing on my part <laughs> uh, but uh, you know it is I, I i did buy some on the rise up and uh at a level higher than where we're at today but you know that is what it is that's why you get in the stock markets right yeah yeah no absolutely me as well i have a couple of my yeah. uranium equities are down i not planning on selling i mean it's not what i got in the uranium market for Definitely not before the price has gotten to an incentive price for producers, which is at around, as you said, like 50, maybe 60s. Yeah. So, um, well, yeah, you know, critics, you're always going to have those. Hopefully, as you that, said, you can prove them wrong by executing, of course. Yeah. And, you know, and, and like I said, I, 
I don't have a problem with critics uh, at all. Uh, they they have because, like I said, everybody has has a right to their own opinion and their own view. I don't have to agree with them, but then again, they don't have to agree with me either. And um, and so hopefully that uh, I can address their criticism by executing and delivering. And, uh, and if I don't, I certainly hope to continue to hear from them. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. As um. Criticism helps a lot. I always say in my videos yeah. that I welcome criticism and skepticism because as a beginner, criticism is priceless. It's worth much more yeah. than all the other things that you can have. And um, <clears throat> you just said, hopefully you can prove them wrong by uh, executing well. And uh, yeah, that'd be great. Executing in a growth strategy is what I'm thinking. And that is yep. actually something that I, I do want to talk about. Because when I first looked into Encore Energy, it, it sort of gave me the idea of, um, I guess, an let's call it an aggressive M&A company that, that wants to have many assets and grow through the growth of those assets. Yep. And um, on the M&A part, side of the business, there hasn't been too much movement lately, right? And, mm -hmm. and I guess that could be one of the reasons why a lot of people bought in. So um, I'm thinking, let's address that. What are some of your plans going forward? Are there any M&As on the schedule that you could talk about? I'll just tell you, we have a couple of that, couple of M&A opportunities we're working on. Uh, I can't be specific because obviously we're under non-disclosure agreements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I don't want to get into disclosing anything that uh, hasn't already been shared with the public. So I'd be cautious of that. But I will say that uh, when you talk about the M&A, it certainly is part of our 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 day-to-day -day, uh, activities. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, hopefully we'll have some, you know, be able to talk about it more in depth and, and more detail, uh, assuming that we come to terms with it, you know, as you know, m and is a, it, it takes two to tango. And, and uh, so you have to get, you know, both sides up to an agreement. We haven't reached that point on, on the, 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 the points of attack we've been making. And, uh, and so, uh, but I think we're getting, you know, we're seeing some progress, but I, I just can't get into any details on it, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I, uh, obviously, I respect that. Um, and, you know, at the beginning of the video, we talked about um, about your cash position, but it did sound like that maybe won't be enough to run the company and also invest in other projects. Um, you don't have any, any debt, which is, you know, good, but... Um, if I'm not mistaken, you also have a relationship with Red Cloud Securities. And so this kind of smells like sheer dilution to my uh, inexperienced nose. So I'd love to know how you plan on raising money to, to achieve your growth goals. And uh, if you could give me a timeline on, timeline on that, that'd also be great. Well, we're comfortable with our cash position in the first quarter of 2022. Uh, and... Uh, you know, for executing the plans we currently and have everything, doing everything we currently have in our plans, uh, which we believe will be accretive to our, our whole story. And, uh, but the, uh, obviously, you know, I've mentioned we got to put in a well fields and everything if we intend to do what we say we're going to do. And that requires some form of financing. We are, you know, I think our, our preference would be to look eventually at debt since so we don't get so dilutive and basically pay for it out of revenue. Uh, but uh, we haven't uh, committed to that yet, uh, but uh, we certainly are keeping an eye on that, mm -hmm. uh, on, on where our cash position is relatively uh, to our needs. Uh, you know, we are, you know, if, if we feel like, you know, we don't want to go dip into sell our uranium inventory at this point, if we, if, but if, if we have to, we, we will look at exploring that to, to keep from doing further financing mm -hmm. or deferring financing you never get beyond that because everything takes cash to make it happen. We want to deliver on execute on our strategy that we've told our shareholders. We will have to do some form of financing. And uh, we are looking at uh, principally at, uh, you know, we're looking at that as one of those, you know, one of the key ways to get there. Okay. That's good to know. I think I, I think I like this strategy as far as far as I, I can understand it, of course, but I also like there's not a perfect strategy, right? Because nothing's That's really right. perfect. So um, in that line of speaking, Paul, what would you say are like the biggest risks for Encore? Like, like maybe what, what keeps you awake at night? Honestly, uh, what keeps me awake at night is delivering on that near-term strategy uh, to that, you know, being at that production ready state 
uh, by uh, 2023 when we expect the market to give us that, that uh, signal t- to go into production. And, I, and, and, that, and there's, there's a couple of factors then is that although our, our facilities we acquire from Westwater are fully licensed and permitted, the projects we intend to feed those projects with have to go through, in the, in the case of the licensing side, they have to be amended to the, exist, to the Rosita and Kingsville Dome licenses but we have to do a few perm- some permitting activities that have to go with that. And the one unfortunate thing with permitting, and even though I've been in the permitting world almost my entire career, and, I've, and Texas has got a very uh, business-friendly regulatory environment and a very well-structured and well-understood environment, uh, there's always, it's once you hand over your application to a third party, whether it's the government or anything else, it's out of your control at that point. And those are the type of things that keep me awake. So what do I got to do to mitigate the risk on that? Mm-hmm. How do I need to structure that? And so one of the things we're doing right now is that uh, as we're going through and acquiring these properties, I've talked about a few times already, uh, we're already doing the, preparing the permitting work, even though we're kind of, we're doing it in parallel track to the acquisition uh, in order to, meet that timing need because of those are the type, like I said, the things that keep me awake at night are not being able to, there, there's key milestones I have in my head that need to be met. And that's what keeps me focused on, on, on those data. My day-to-day activity structure is built around meeting those objectives. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're not, there's no financial tie to those objectives to me. They're just milestones I have built into my, my timeline uh, for, executing, you know, getting property structure, getting technical reports out, getting, uh, and, and getting permits, uh, applications submit, submitted to the state in a timely manner and as fully uh, formed as possible so that uh, we have minimal review time uh, uh, on those so that uh, we can have everything in hand uh, so that when the gun goes off, figuratively, uh, we'll be able to go without any any waiting. And that that's the strategy I built around my previous experience working at other companies where we were able to build everything, put it in place. And then when the market showed up, uh, the company said, here's the money. Well, the, you know, we got the money and we went and we took off and we were in production and we're making, having, you know, not only do we have yellow cake all over the place but in various unusual storage areas, uh, but uh, we also were making a, a good amount, you know, significant you know, amount of revenue because we were able to do that as the market was appreciating. Yeah, listen, Paul, I've, I can really keep asking you questions, but you, you've promised me an hour. I've already taken, I guess, more, almost more than an hour. So, um, yeah, you know, I'm, uh, I'm about to let you go here. But uh, given that, um, again, as I mentioned a couple of times, I'm relatively new to this, there is definitely something that I'm forgetting to ask you here. So uh, what is something that you think we should be talking about, but I forgot to ask you, Paul? Well, you know, we, one of the things that uh, we really haven't talked about is kind of our view on why, why do we think, 20, I mentioned a little bit about 2023 and why we built our strategy around that. It's because we, we believe that it's important to, uh, first of all, that is seems based on what I've done. My my own. I've talked to fourteen utilities, uh, fuel buyers for them, and, and and interrogated them on when they think they're going to have openings and demand. Uh, uh, and that twenty twenty three period is when they're starting to see openings. I've been receiving requests for proposals uh, from various utilities and responding to them uh, with uh, prices and the you know sales prices in the range that uh, uh, we've discussed earlier. You know that close to $50 per pound uh, sales price and uh, and uh, been responsible to those. And those are all starting 2023 deliveries. Uh, and also the uh, it's coincident with some of the other market factors, including when the changes in, and uh, the imports under the Russian suspension agreement changed dramatically. Uh, so I see that that's why we built, that's why the 2023 number sits on the horizon for us. And you know, I want to make sure people understand that this, it's not just an arbitrary date for us. It's a it's a real date. It's a date that's all all the inputs I've been able to gather point to that time period as being the time period when we're going to see the market begin to respond like we expect it to. Mm-hmm. And so our short term strategy, our Texas strategy, is built around that. 
We've talked about New Mexico. I mean, uh, our, our M and A activity. We've talked a bit about New Mexico, and you know, the other thing we're doing also within New Mexico is working on on the, uh, the social aspects because that's what we see as the the, the critical path within the New Mexico story is uh, the licensing and permitting are driven by uh, uh, tribal issues that are, are, are exist in, in, that, in that part of the country. And we're very cognizant of that. And so we've actually started to, you know, we're, we're beginning to start a, we started initially prior to COVID, but we're, we're re restarting the, uh, uh, our, our community effort in, in New Mexico to try and, and build, uh, uh, for lack of a better phrase, social license in that area. Uh, so that when we go to apply to to start executing on our New Mexico uh, development, uh, that uh, we're treating the, the the local tribal communities more as a almost you know creating a situation where we can create some sweat equity for them uh, and the activity rather than just building a you know a, a helping build a park or something like that or, or a promise strictly of jobs. Uh, the and so we see that as part of a key part of our strategy because the legacy that exists in New Mexico with uh, those communities is is pretty negative when it comes to uranium, but it's also where the largest amount of uranium resource in the United States rest is in that part part of the country, and to gain access to that and, and to to sustain your operations out there is is a key part of that our strategy, and uh, we believe that we can execute on that, but it's going to be one of those things. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to take a bit of work. And so we, we haven't talked about that, but that's the reality of New Mexico. And uh, uh, it's a great place to work, lovely country, fantastic resources. But it's going to take some work to, to get us to the point where we actually have that ability to operate. Okay, so it's not without challenges. That's so, so clear. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and that's a very good point. You know, Paul, you've given me some very good insights. And um, even though I didn't didn't send you any questions that you can prepare up front, you still had some pretty good answers, all of which just makes me more confident and proves to me that you're very experienced. And you, I mean, you just know what you're doing, which is that that's something that's worth a lot, right? Thank and, you very um, much. Oh, I just by the way, I just remembered something that I um I should be asking. You, you mentioned something about it before, and I should be asking that. Like I I kind of stole that question from Rick Rule, uh, is it's really good, but. If I buy into Encore Energy, but like I still want some diversification, what other three companies, three, yeah, let's say three companies, would you suggest I look into? Oh, well, that's a good question. You know, the, because it depends on what you want to do with that money, right? Uh, and, um, you know, the, the, you know the, the safe money goes to Kazadam Prom and Cameco, but that's not necessarily where everybody wants to go. Uh, the, uh, but, uh, you know, I would say some of these, uh, uh, the story out of the Athabasca is exciting, you know, for a portion of my money, I, I put some money, you know, some up there and, and, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, if there's an opportunity to, you know, the, uh, I, I, I like the, the stories around, you know, the, some of the U S developed production guys. I like the UR energy story. Uh, I know those guys will have a high level of confidence in their management. Uh, I, I still got money in energy fuels because I think there's a diverse there's a, a diverse story there. It's a it's a it's a different story than everybody else has, and uh, I still got quite a bit, quite a few, you know, a significant portion of my my holdings still remain in energy fuels, and I don't plan to liquidate that any time now. Every time when I talk to before I talk to somebody, like I do a lot of homework and research, write down a couple of questions, and I feel like okay, now I'm prepared. And then after talking to somebody who is as experienced as yourself, I'm like okay, I have a lot of homework to do. So, uh, yeah, you know, um, you have a business that you get to, you have to go to. Uh, I have a lot of homework that I got to do. So I'll let you go here. But uh, if there's anything that I forgot to ask that the viewers would want to see answered, is there a way for them to reach out directly to you? Yeah, so they can reach out to me through my email address. Uh, and that's P as in Paul. P. Goranson, G O R A N S O N, at EncoreEnergyCorp.com. Awesome. Thank you for sharing your own email. Not many do that. So, uh, also, thank you for being here, uh, my sir. I really appreciate it and hopefully speak soon. All right. Thanks for your time and enjoy the conversation. And hopefully, I helped uh, with your education project. <laughs> oh, you definitely did. You definitely did. And again, I hope you can, you'll be able to help me 
further if uh, if I have any questions or developments about the company and yeah, stuff like that. So uh, yeah, feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thank you for your time. Have a good one. Thanks. You Bye. too.